Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be opening another Global Immuno Talk. Thank you again for joining us. Um, so I'm here today, as always, with the co-organizers of the seminars, Dr. Carla Rodlin. And today we are with uh, our great speaker, Katrin Meyer Barber uh, from NIH, that will be introduced by Carla. And uh, I would like to go through the goals before we start with the, with the introduction and the seminar. Uh, as always, remember, we would like to benefit and inspire immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner and to increase opportunities for scientific learning without traveling, making these talks inclusive, accommodating and environmentally friendly. And uh, just uh, would like to briefly uh, remind you that next week, Boris Races will be giving the Global Immuno Talk. And again, thank all the speakers that uh, have participated and con will continue to participate in this seminar series. So thank you so much. And uh, Carla uh, will introduce Ketu. Thank you so much, uh, Elina. It is indeed uh, my real pleasure to introduce our global immuno speaker today, Dr. Katrin Meyer Barber. Kat is the Earl Stadman Tenure Track Investigator and leads the Inflammation and Innate Immunity Unit at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at NIH. As many of our previous speakers, Kat is also an international scientist. She was born in Germany, where she obtained her diploma at the University of Würzburg. I apologize for my pronunciation, um, but it was there already where um, at this very early stage of her career, Kat started to focus on the immune response uh, to infections in the lung. And then she came to the United States where she did her PhD under the mentorship of Dr. Marcus Morse at the Trudeau Institute. I'm sure this provides her a very solid foundation for her career, which she continued um, as a postdoc with Alan Scher at NIH. And it is there where she started to focus on the immune response to mycobacterium tuberculosis. Just to highlight the importance of this research area, I was finding today that according to the WHO, it is estimated that 1.5 million people unfortunately died of TB in 2018. Now, during this time, uh, Kat discovered a really intriguing crosstalk between type 1 interference and IL-1 beta. Specifically, what she discovered is that type 1 interference can limit the production of IL-1 beta and that this leads to exacerbation of this disease. And what I found um, very interesting is that she made use of this knowledge to develop therapeutic approaches that are centered on targeting this response of the host to the mycobacterium, rather than the more conventional approaches that are centered on targeting the mycobacterium itself. So this, I think, is a very important concept that Kat brought on how to target host pathogen interactions in the context of TB. Now, I want to highlight another thing that I realized going through her CV, which I found truly remarkable, and is that she was the corresponding author of these manuscripts from her postdoctoral work. This I find is quite unusual and I think underscores her leadership in these projects. Now, it was back in 2011 when I first met Kat. I was visiting NIH and actually we had recently discovered a pathway that suppresses the response to type 1 interference. So we had a lot of shared interest. And it was obvious from my scientific discussions with Kat that she was absolutely committed to understanding this crosstalk between type 1 interference and IL-1 beta and the implications that this would have. So in my opinion, uh, she has the focus and commitment that I have learned to appreciate in scientists that push the boundaries of our current knowledge. So Kat, it has been a personal pleasure for me to see you progress and achieve this level of independence in your career uh, since, you know, we met like a decade ago. And I very much look forward to learning more uh, on this topic on pulmonary innate immunity 
during mycobacterium tuberculosis. Thanks so much for accepting our invitation. Well, thank you guys for inviting me and it's such an honor to be included as an early career investigator amongst this amazing uh, lineup of world-leading scientists. So thank you and really thank you for putting this together. I think this is a very important cause, very much appreciated by everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kat, for accepting. So as you know, before we start, we love to learn more about our speakers. And today, we don't just have one question, we have two. <laughs> so uh, what we would love to know is first, what has been the most exciting aspect of starting your lab at NIH, one of the most prestigious institutions worldwide? And then what has been the most significant challenge that you had to surpass to become an independent principal investigator? So what has been exciting and what has been, you know, some of the significant challenges, if you can share that with us. So, you know, for those who don't know, the NIH is the leading funding agency of research in the United States, but they also have a massive research campus. That's where I'm located in, in Maryland. And it's amazing. It's like a science city and you come here and you really have an expert in any field just in the neighboring hallway. Um, there's so much interaction and scientific exchange. And of course, the infrastructure, um, having trained as a cellular immunologist, the major impetus for me getting into TB research was that here at the NIH, we have these amazing facilities that really don't limit us in our ability to do cutting edge immunology, even though we have to do this in high containment. So it's, it's an amazing scientific environment and I'm very fortunate that they kept me. Wonderful. Any challenges? Well, you know, I think basically like most challenges um, that everyone has setting up a new lab um, is to, to find people who want to work with you instead of this other famous established investigator. Um, and so for the first time you have to hire people. So that was a challenge. But I think more specifically to my program, having to run a high containment lab and setting up a high containment lab from scratch um, is not an easy task. Um, they're notoriously unreliable. There's uh, shutdowns that are scheduled, but also unscheduled shutdowns and interruptions when the annual facility has to close and things like that. So that, I would say this has been one of the biggest challenge, but we have, um, uh, amazing facilities here and uh, you know it's been it's been a great ride <laughs> wonderful thank you so much for sharing that and thank you for your commitment to understanding much better this very serious disease so we look forward to your talk let's see if you can share now your slides okay, okay. let me try this again yeah share and then the next one. Can you see? Perfect. That's excellent yeah. cut. Um, and your, and your. I just want to get the point set. Okay. We are all set. All okay. right. We are all ears. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so, uh, um, as Carla mentioned, um, I'm interested in pulmonary innate immunity and um, we're studying tuberculosis and as you know, it's a bacterial pathogen that causes um, chronic infections. It's transmitted, uh, transmitted by aerosol and really um, uh, makes, makes home inside in infected cells and is an intracellular chronic pathogen. Um, it's really been with us and human, humankind for an extremely long time. Um, it's, mummies were found that had remains of uh, uh, TB and uh, we, it's estimated that it's been with us for at least 40,000 years. And um, the current pandemic, I think, is putting public health and, and into a different uh, perspective again. But I want to remind people that it was really TB that um, catapulted research into immunology, infectious disease and public health um, uh, at the turn of the century um, and before because as you know, uh, TB was around uh, uh, back then and was really important. It uh, had had its own names, like the White Plague. Um, it's causing a very long, drawn-out um, disease that makes you lose weight. So it's also called mankind's slow stain or consumption. And I think what what people don't quite realize that it really has killed more humans than any other infectious pathogen 
Um, and it's estimated that the impact over the last 200 years was at least 1 billion deaths that have been attributed to TB. And just to put that a little bit in perspective, um, for example, in 1850 in England, one out of four deaths was due to TB. In the turn of the century in Germany, um, TB had an incidence rate of uh, almost 200 per 100,000. And just to compare this with our current epidemic in the US right now, it's estimated that um, the incidence rate of COVID is 52 in 100,000. So this had a major public health impact. It really fostered um, sanitary hand hygiene, a mask wearing, open air, um, open air schools and things like that, that um, these are expertises that um, we're actually currently drawing on during the corona pandemic. And so here I'm showing you the, the latest incidence rates um, globally from 2018. And as you can see, the primarily affected areas um, currently are Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Asia and, and also so Russia. So this is still a really uh, uh, important disease. And in fact, um, the latest WHO report um, showed that uh, TB um, cost the lives of at least one and a half million in 2018. And it's still the number one causing path, uh, pathogen and microbe that, that leads to mortality worldwide. So why do we still have TB around? Well, it's, the management has really been quite complicated. Um, we actually do not have a highly effective vaccine. Um, the, the vaccine available currently, BCG, has been discovered about, about 100 years ago and doesn't really protect um, against adult pulmonary disease very well. Um, a lot of uh, effort is currently ongoing to improve BCG vaccination strategies, but also new adjuvants and, and comp composite vaccines um, that are really promising. The other problem has really been um, the emergence of antibiotic drug resistance. So um, as soon as antibiotics um, came about in the uh, um, 1940s, um, it really had an impact on TB and people thought this, this, this would cure it. But really, um, it has not been able to, to eradicate TB uh, completely. We have emergence of drug-resistant TB strains, totally drug-resistant TB strains, and uh, extremely drug-resistant TB strains. And not only that, the reason why this is most likely um, such a big problem is the standard antibiotic treatment regimen can take anywhere from four to four months to, to a year of, of, of antibiotics that have sometimes severe side effects. So um, the, the other really important issue has been um, HIV co-infection, as you can imagine, um, that uh, CD4 T cells and adaptive immunity is important and uh, the, the distribution in Sub-Saharan Africa of the HIV TB co-pandemic is really uh, uh, tremendous. But I also want to highlight that now in 2020, we have another challenge, which is the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And I want to just um, uh, mention quickly something that came in the Nature editorial that it, indeed COVID-19 has turned the clock back many years, if not decades, in the fight against infectious diseases such as TB, but also malaria. And so all the gains we might have made in the last decade might be really lost. And, and one of the problems is really um, that there has been a massive um, lack in, um, in TB case detection rates um, due to the pandemic. People are not getting diagnosed properly. They cannot go and get their medications. And there's a major disruption that has been modeled to cost an additional 400,000 lives, um, um, most likely this year. So um, this has really been, been really uh, uh, an oversight and it's been, it's been really important that we focus on that. And there, I encourage you to read up more about this and some really amazing articles here. So um, as I mentioned, uh, the you know, switching now to the immunity to TB, um, CD4 T cells are absolutely critically uh, required for protection. And these are the, the efforts going on in vaccine development. But, um, Really, TB is an intracellular um, pathogen that primarily infects macrophages and phagocytes. So actually, they're, they're the cell type that are super critical for executing the elimination of the bacteria inside um, the, themselves and also in containing uh, the bacteria in the phagosome, uh, 
in, in trying to get rid of the bacteria. So they are the executioner cell, so to speak, that get help from T cells to get rid of the bacteria. And one of the key things I want to focus on is really how um, innate inflammation has really uh, come to the forefront as a critical component of disease in that um, active TB disease can almost be considered as an inflammatory disease and how we try to harness that. So just to talk a little bit about the, the, the so to speak, immunological life cycle of TB, as I mentioned, um, it's expelled through cough and aerosol and then it's being inhaled and um, for, for decades, we assumed that um, alveolar macrophages were really the first um, cell type as a tissue resident macrophage population to take up the bacteria. And I, I highlight this assumed because uh, I also wanna highlight some of the challenges we have in the field because it's really been just the last year and a half that we confirmed this experimentally by beautiful work um, from Kevin Erdl's lab and Sarah Cohen, Alan Adam and Elisa Rothschild. They, they really provided the first evidence that it's truly um, in the alveolar macrophage and um, the, the ability to detect bacteria with fluorescence have greatly aided in that. And so um, this tissue resident alveolar macrophage has very unique properties and somehow TB resides in these alveolar macrophages for a very long time considering um, the, it's a bacterial infection. So basically for the first uh, week, um, TB exclusively resides in these alveolar macrophages. And we don't really know what happens after. Um, we know eventually the bacteria has, have to escape the alveolar macrophages. They are transferred to other myeloid subsets in this uh, early innate immune phase, and which really takes quite a lot of time. And it's a big black box and one of the key areas of interest um, in my lab. And the fact that it takes so long really contributes to this um, notorious delayed um, priming and lack of T helper priming um, in TB. So it's not until day, day 10 or day 14 that um, CCR2 dependent monocytes um, carry live bacteria to the lung draining lymph node to initiate um, priming. So this has been really elegant work by um, Eric Pema's group and also Joel Ernst's groups really showing that you need live uh, bacteria in the lung draining lymph node and that this process takes a very long time in TB. And again, the, the, the exact mechanisms of the, the detail of this delay um, are not well understood. But once you have um, T cells being primed in the lymph node, they eventually migrate back into the lung and that usually happens around, you know, a little bit before three weeks after infection, day 18, day 21. And the, the adaptive T cells move back into the lung tissue they start to um, make uh, help the infected cells. They provide T cell macrophage interactions that are beneficial um, in, in humans um, and other experimental animal models that form these bona fide granulomatous structure. Um, there is this idea that the bacteria are being walled off and um, either way, the T cells play a fundamental role in this whether, um, and, and it's uh, really thought it's a protective um, immune response. So you have um, T cells that are interacting with infected cells, a lot of different types of innate immune cells and the exact details of this structure and the ex exact details as to how this um, protection is maintained um, are under heavy investigation. Um, suffice it to say that the majority of people probably mount a protective immune response this way and really, um, it's this inflammatory balance that leads to, to control. But for reasons that are not well understood, um, about 10% of individuals that are infected go on to, to have this tissue pathology that's um, associated with the loss of an inflammatory balance. And that can happen anywhere after you know, a month and a half to a year or years after infection. And the, the time points I'm showing you here are based on the, the workhorse of the experimental immunologist, um, what we know from mouse studies. So eventually, um, this protective structure falls apart, the bacteria can replicate, there's tissue damage, and um, in, in humans, you can get uh, cavities that are adjacent to airways, and when you have these high levels of bacteria and cell-free bacteria, um, you then um, start the process and the transmission cycle by expelling these free bacteria 
out of the um, person that has the active disease. So I really want to highlight um, that uh, this tissue pathology is a and, and the loss of the inflammatory balance is really very important in TB. One of the first clues about this came from uh, studies about a um, very classical inflammatory cytokine, TNF-alpha. So mice deficient in TNF-alpha are highly susceptible because that is really an important inflammatory cytokine uh, to aid in protection against TB, and that was beautifully demonstrated um, by Joy and Flynn. On the other hand, um, individuals who had latent TB um, and then uh, became uh, got treatment with a TNF blockade really increased the likelihood um, of people to get active uh, TB disease. So we know from clinical studies that TNF blockade really um, disrupts this uh, protective inflammatory balance and leads to active disease. And that was beautifully shown by, by Joe Keane about 20 years ago. So um, in in data, I don't, I, I don't have time to get into, but um, one of the, the key principles that has been coming out of this was really pioneered by David Tobin and Lalita Ramakrishnan in the Seeperfish model, where they show that not enough TNF um, increases disease severity, but also too much type 1 interferon is equally to excessive um, inflammation and loss of bacterial control and disease severity. So it really highlights this Goldilocks principle of inflammation where just enough, just the right amount of inflammation is important. And it can be a cytokine or an inflammatory mediator that's protective if you don't have it. Um, so it's really critically required. But if you have too much of it, this is also a bad thing. So it's really just right. And I think um, one of the things we, we realized as we're studying counter-regulatory um, pathway loops was that it's not a binary um, more or less of one cytokine, which of course is, is something to consider, but it's really an interconnectedness of multiple inflammatory pathways that are kind of involved in this. And that's really what my lab is, is focusing on, is trying to understand um, innate inflammation at the uh, molecular level and the pathway level, but also at the, the cellular uh, players that are involved to determine the outcome of TB infection. So really the, the key question you're asking, what are the molecular and cellular features of host protective versus host detrimental inflammation in TB? And how can we translate our findings into novel targets for host directed therapies or to improve adjuvant design to, to have better vaccine strategies? And we're really um, uh, using a very uh, multi-directional approach nowadays. Uh, we have set up very strong uh, collaborations uh, with clinical colleagues around the world and locally here to do non-human primate research. On the other hand, we really focus the majority of our work in the, in the mouse animal model of TB. And just to um, highlight this real quick here, so we expose um, mice uh, with a low number of bacteria in, through the aerosol route. And what happens is that um, TB is, establishes a chronic infection in B6 mice where um, the bacteria replicate very uh, logarithmically for the first four weeks, adaptive immunity kicks in and then they kind of level off. And B6 mice can live for up to a year um, uh, after TB infection. And I just wanna highlight again that, you know, um, there are some challenges with all of this work and everything I'm going to show you really happened in, in a high containment facility, both for the animals as well as the regular lab work. Um, and so this, this has really been, been uh, an effort from uh, a lot of people and um, it's just not as, as easy as it, it might look at first glance. So what we know about IL-1 and type 1 interferon pathways in response to TB um, has really been uh, a lot at this point. Um, we, we understand that in, in infected macrophages, um, IL-1 can be triggered through the AIM-2 and NLRP3 inflammasomes by recognition of uh, bacterial um, DNA. Um, at the same time, in the cytosol, type 1 interferon is also being triggered by, by TB. And um, I just want to highlight a lot of the groundwork uh, breaking uh, work that has elucidated all these pathways um, over the last decade or so. And um, we have a, a good understanding, primarily in vitro, about all of these players. We focus. Um, on trying to understand these pathways um, in vivo, in the animal models. 
And we have a particular focus on IL-1 and type 1 interferon, where we know IL-1 is protective, but type 1 interferon seems to be um, detrimental when you have too much excessive type 1 interferon-driven inflammation. And just to give you um, some, some primer about uh, type 1 interferon, um, it's really been about 10 years now that it's really come to the forefront um, in the inflammation um, research in the context of, of TB and really by a seminal paper by, by Anne O'Gara in 2010. Um, what they found was that you could actually predict or you can actually identify active TB patients just by looking at the whole blood transcriptional gene signature and that um, this signature was really enriched in interferon signaling, both type 1 and type 2 interferon. Um, this has since then been uh, confirmed and reported and extended for diagnostic purposes by many other laboratories. And it's been uh, shown to um, stratify, just based on this interferon signature, uh, patients that are at risk to become active. And maybe um, uh, some, some, some idea that this type 1 interferon might be uh, detrimental for, for health and, and contribute to active disease was that there was a, a, a loss of function mutation in the type 1 interferon receptor that was actually associated um, with resistance to TB. And then, of course, in experimental animal models, um, it's uh, really become clear that there is a detrimental role of type 1 interferon. And I don't have time to really go through this. And also, um, we have um, contributed a lot in, in my time with Alan Scherer um, on the detrimental role of type 1 interferon in, in animals. Um, we, we showed that co-infection with influenza, for example, exacerbates TB in a type 1 interferon-dependent manner, and that type 1 interferon very heavily inhibits um, IL-1. And um, uh, work by a lot of others um, highlighted here really um, seems to, to favor the idea that uh, type 1 interferon primarily has a detrimental role. Um, on, in contrast, IL-1 seems to be protective in a sense um, that we find without IL-1, IL-1 deficient animals that are either lacking IL-1 receptor signaling or the two um, cytokines that bind the IL-1 receptor are completely susceptible to TB and cannot control bacterial replication and their, their lungs are filled with bacteria and are super necrotic. And so this was kind of known when I joined um, Alan Scher's lab in my postdoc. And I really wanted to understand, being a cytokine junkie, what would IL-1 be doing and how, how is all of this working? And of course, as you know, um, the IL-1 cytokine system is one of the most uh, complicated cytokine systems. And in part because um, it's a very potent inflammatory cytokine and has to be very tightly regulated to avoid excessive inflammation and tissue damage. And so there are pros, um, translational checkpoints in, in um, IL-1 regulation, but most famously, you need to actually process IL-1 beta to generate um, active IL-1 beta through uh, cleavage and the, the whole process of the inflammasome um, serves as another checkpoint of regulation. So I really wanted to know whether um, IL-1 alpha or IL-1 beta would be important for this control uh, observed in these mice. And when, what we found um, was very clearly IL-1 beta alone was really important for um, host resistance to TB. If the mice lacked IL-1 beta, they were highly susceptible. But what we uh, found um, very early on in vivo was that caspase-1 um, or um, ASC, ASC mice, actually did not phenocopy this, suggesting that their inflammasome-independent pathways of generating IL-1 beta in vivo. So now I told you in vitro, the IL-1 production is 100% is NLIP3 and caspase-1 dependent and ASC dependent, but we went on to show that in vivo, this was not the case and that IL-1 beta could be cleaved in the lungs of caspase-1 uh, deficient mice. And of course, now we know that those were actually caspase-1 11 double deficient mice. And then later on, um, Jenny Ting's lab and Stefan Kaufmann's lab and Anke Dohoi very nicely showed that NLRP3 uh, deficient animals really have no phenotype in TB. On the other hand, IL-1 beta knockout mice um, die quite rapidly. So while IL-1 uh, production is NLRP3 dependent in vitro, we really early on 
uh, learn to really start um, look primarily focusing on in vivo work and trying to really understand what's happening. So then um, if R1 beta was important, what about R1 alpha? So I got my hands on the R1 alpha knockouts as well. And what we found was really quite interesting. So basically you need both R1 alpha and R1 beta um, because without each of these um, cytokines individually, you cannot control, you have a log, log and a half increase in CFU. Of course, if both of them are missing, this is um, increased, the susceptibility. So I think um, this highlights really nicely that both R1 alpha and R1 beta are important and they're non-redundantly um, uh, important for protection. And we're trying to understand the differential contributions of these. But just like um, the example of excessive inflammation, and of course, this is R1, um, beautiful work by uh, Bibuti Mishra and uh, Chris Sassetti has shown that in the right context, too much R1 can also be really detrimental, and particularly in the context of uh, NOS2 deficiency, because they've showed that INOS um, could inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. So how does R1 protect against TB? What does it do? Um, we still don't really know everything. Um, we've just started to really um, scratch the surface, I think. But um, one of the things that we understood um, that we had to look at was unconventional pathways since I spent a lot of time in my postdocs doing experiment that gave me negative results. Um, eventually, we started looking into the direction of lipid mediators. And what we found that R1 is actually super important to induce arachidonic acid-derived eicosanoid lipid mediators, such as prostaglandin E2, PGE2. So here I'm showing you um, the measurement of PG2 in the bowel fluid from TB infected mice that are either wild type or R1 receptor deficient. And I think what you can see is that um, without R1 receptor signaling, there is very little PG2. We went on to show that if we add back PG2 to R1 deficient animals, we can extend survival to some extent. And um, most importantly, and very interestingly, we found that PG2 can inhibit the detrimental type 1 interferon reduction. Here we've done um, uh, in vitro studies on human monocyte derived macrophages. Um, so then we in turn realized that without IL-1 receptor, you have a massive increase in type 1 interferon, in part because you don't have PG2 to inhibit it. And this excessive type 1 interferon could be contributing to the pathology and the susceptibility. And to formally prove that and, and test it, we generated R1 receptor, if not double deficient mice. And indeed, if we take away this excessive type 1 interferon driven inflammation, we were able to largely extend um, and rescue R1 receptor deficient animals. So really what we um, highlighted here and discovered, and I don't, I'm not gonna go into all these details, is that IL-1 and type 1 interferon really um, represent a counter-regulatory loop that's at the center of TB control. And that both type 1 interferon and IL-1 represent very opposing different classes of innate inflammation. And TB is a beautiful way to amplify that and to study this. So IL-1 is important for protection. Uh, we, don't, we know that PG2 is involved and IL-1 limits bacterial replication. On the other hand, type 1 interferon drives bacterial replication. And um, in data I didn't have uh, time to show you, um, we and others really clearly showed that type 1 interferon can also inhibit IL-1 and it does it through the induction of immunosuppressive IL-10 and um, IL-1 receptor antagonist, which is that third ligand for the IL-1 receptor that blocks um, IL-1 uh, signaling. So um, IL-1 uh, induces PG-2 and uh, PG-2 can inhibit bacterial replication, but also inhibit type 1 interferon. The exact details of, of how this all works is still something that I think um, a lot of us are interested in trying to understand, and it's an ongoing effort in the lab. But what we really try to do is how can we leverage this knowledge now and translate it into um, perhaps therapies? Could we devise a host-directed therapy based on this knowledge? And so what we did was really more of a proof of concept study to show that manipulation of inflammation alone um, 
would alter the outcome of infection. And this is important because if you have drug resistant TB, but you have active disease, maybe we can target the disease process rather than the bacteria who might be very resistant to treatment at this point. And so what we used uh, was a, a, a model that has been established by Lisa Antonelli in Allen's lab, where she showed that if you give the double-stranded RNA homolog, poly IC, to B6 mice, they all of a sudden become highly susceptible to TB. And this is very type 1 lift neuron dependent. If we add now PG2 or Siluton, which is a 5 0 inhibitor, and shunts the uh, lipid mediator production towards increased PG2, we now can inhibit this type 1 nephron driven disease and we can completely protect against wasting and um, survival um, in these animals. And just to highlight here um, the type 1 nephron levels in the mice, so if you um, add poly IC, you get this increase in type 1 interferon in the lungs of these mice. If you add back PG2 alone, you can see the suppression, suppression uh, by PG2 of type 1 nephron. And the same is true when we add siluton or both. And um, what happens is that, you know, the uh, type 1 nephron drives IL-1 receptor antagonist expression in another way to inhibit the type 1 nephron pathway. And so if we decrease type 1 nephron, we also see a reduction in IL-1 receptor antagonist. So dry, um, trying to uh, address type 1 interferon-driven disease, which could be very similar to what we see in patients, is a very promising target for host-directed therapy. And um, Russell Vance Group uh, just recently very nicely demonstrated this, um, that if you target directly IL-1 receptor antagonist, this could be also a very potent host-directed therapy. So what they did, they used this uh, very widely used uh, mouse model, the B6SST1S mouse, often also referred to as the Kramnik mouse. And they demonstrate very nicely that this mouse that models um, features of human disease is 100% uh, type 1 interferon dependent as well. And so by blocking IL-1 receptor antagonist, they were able to reduce bacterial loads in this type 1 interferon driven scenario as well. So um, inflammation is, is really a key driver of pathology. And one of the pathologies we've been studying in this context was the, was the tissue destruction that's seen with excessive type 1 interferon in the absence of IL-1 receptor deficient mice. And so this is just to highlight what these lungs look like. So on the left, you see a, a wild type lung that's um, uh, four weeks, three weeks after infection. In red, you can see TB. And in green, you see um, the staining of extracellular HMGB1 in this thick um, lung staining um, uh, uh, from these mice. And I think very clearly, you can see that without IL-1 receptor, you have massive tissue damage, um, extracellular and, and massive bacterial replication, and lots of um, cellular necrosis that can be stained by HMGB1. So we wanted to know whether this increased lung necrosis in MTB infected mice is due to um, uncontrolled intracellular bacterial replication. In other words, is IL-1 receptor expression by infected cells required to limit intracellular TB growth? So you can envision a scenario where um, TB really needs um, to be contained in this phagolysosome by the infected cell. And somehow IL-1 signals are really important in maintenance of this phagolysosome and uh, in keeping the bacterial replication a check. So without IL-1 receptor, you might have a lot of bacteria inside the infected cell. Eventually, they break out into the cytosol and um, you get cellular lysis with the birth size that um, Hardy Korn Kornfeld really pioneered. So um, we have some hints that this might be happening because um, in a really Herculean effort, Nicole van der Vel, um, assessed the, the localization of TB in infected cells from lungs of infected wild type or IL-1 receptor knockout mice. And she looked in over a thousand infected cells trying to understand where is TB local, localized in infected pulmonary cells. So in, in wild type cells, very little, less than 5%, um, are, of bacteria are located in the cytosol. However, when you have necrosis 
in R1 receptor deficient lungs, up to 33% uh, of the bacteria uh, of the infected cells have cytosolic bacteria. And you can see this very, here, uh, very nicely here, where there is no secondary membrane um, by EM um, in these bacteria. And, and this is nicely scored here. So in vivo, it really seems that this could be the case. So we wanted to test it in vitro. When you take um, bone marrow-derived macrophages and infect them in vitro with TB, and they cannot signal through IL-1 or make IL-1, you get increased bacterial loads in the culture. But when we wanted to know whether there are um, more bacteria per cell, we were surprised to find that the average number of bacilli per cell was actually not increased. So that was very different in contrast to our hypothesis that IL-1 receptor expression on infected cells is important to control intracellular bacterial replication. And if we look at the distribution and look at the cells that have, um, we can detect that have a birth size amount of bacteria, very clearly this is not enriched towards higher numbers of bacteria. So of course, we wanted to um, address this more thoroughly in vivo. And here I'm just showing you an example um, how we can um, track infected cells directly by single cell flow cytometry uh, and a fluorescent reporter strain. So in an L1 receptor knockout mouse at this time point, there's a massive loss of bacterial control and you can see the increased frequency of infected neutrophils as about a 12 fold increase. To normalize um, for this lack of control and trying to ask truly whether cell intrinsic L1 receptor is required for control, we generated competitive mixed bomarachimeric animals. So this allows us to track L1 receptor deficient cells and distinguish those from wild-type immune cells based on congenic markers. And so we inject bone marrow into um, irradiated hosts and then later can track exactly which cells are what. So for example, here you can see these are um, knockout neutrophils and these are infected knockout neutrophils and we compare them here to the wild types. And I think what is clear is that as soon as half of your immune system lacks L1 receptor, um, all of a sudden the mouse looks like a normal wild type mouse. So if IL-1 receptor on macrophages, because half of your macrophages lack IL-1 receptor, would be so important for bacterial control, we should see an increase in the total lung even than we, when we play for bacterial loads. And that's not what we see. We went even further to, to formally demonstrate this at this per cell level. So we took ad, um, advantage of our um, ability to fax purify inside the high containment area from these mixed bone marrow mice, the different cell types that we know contain TB. So we fax sorted neutrophils or, or general uh, uh, interstitial macrophages from these infected um, mice based on their um, genotype. And then we played it and normalized for the number of sorted cells. And what I'm showing you here is three independent experiments with 10 mice each. And actually the, the error bar represents technical plating efficiency. So clearly we could not detect a difference in CFU. So there are immune cells here that um, are derived from, from the wild type donor. Could they be protecting in trans? Clearly they are. And is it immune cells that provide this protection? Um, so to answer that, we, we generated, um, uh, we used another approach. We used um, bone marrow chimeric mice that either completely lacked IL-1 receptor or only lacked IL-1 receptor in the immune compartment or only lacked IL-1 receptor in the stromal non-hematopoietic cellular compartment, such as epithelial or endothelial cells. And what we were um, really quite surprised to find out is that only when the entire animal cannot signal through IL-1 do you lose control, shown here in blue. So similar what we saw in our in vitro system, if the entire system lacks IL-1 receptor, um, the bacterial uh, uh, can replicate quite rapidly. But as soon in, in the animals, for example, either immune or non-immune cells can signal through IL-1. Um, they are able to confer protection to these infected macrophages in trans. And that's also highlighted here by the control um, in bacterial loads in the lung. So in other words, as long as one cell type 
in the animal can signal to IL-1 that can perpetuate a uh, protective response onto macrophages that are IL-1 receptor deficient um, for protection. And so we were, wanted to make sure that this is not an artifact of the irradiation. So to finally prove that IL-1 receptor is not required in infected cells for control, we generated IL-1 receptor, conditional IL-1 receptor deficient animals that selectively lack IL-1 receptor in 45, CD45 positive immune cells. And as you can see, whether they have the Cree or not, there is no difference. So IL-1 driven protective inflammation during TB um, really is, 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 is something that we are really um, still actively investigating. And we, we realized that complete lack of IL-1 signaling, whether it's in vitro or in a complete knockout animal, leads to necrosis, increased bacterial loads, as well as extracellular bacteria and cytosolic bacteria. We know that IL-1 triggers protective prostaglandins that promote bacterial control and also inhibit um, detrimental type 1 interferon-driven um, inflammation. And I think what was really fascinating and, and really points us in a whole different direction, you do not have to investigate um, cell autonomous antimicrobial pathways because we know it's the paracrine IL-1 receptor signaling that really mediates intracellular control in trans. And this help can be provided in an IL-1-dependent fashion by both immune cells and non-immune cells. And we're trying to understand which are the cell types that are important for, for IL-1-mediated control. So as I mentioned, um, my lab has two major um, interests. One is um, on the pathway side, and I just uh, um, talked to you a little bit about how we're studying the IL-1 pathway and the type 1 interferon pathway. Um, but the other major axis in the lab is really heavily flow cytometry-based hardcore cellular in vivo immunology, and really trying to understand what are the different innate immune subsets that are present in the early phases of uh, immunity, um, what, are, what is happening at this uh, trans, uh, trans dissemination phase between innate immune cells, and most importantly, what are the cellular players from the innate immune system that are contributing to lack of control or promote control and what are the cells that are present in, in the granulomas? Um, and so to this end, we, we set up an amazing collaboration um, in, at the Shanghai Public Health Clinical Center with K. Wing Wong, where, we, um, uh, where patients undergo resection surgery um, for XDR or MDR TB. And so we were able to receive the lung tissue and process it fresh and look at the cells fresh and what we found was quite interesting. We, we were surprised to find a fairly um, unexpected abundance of eosinophils in human TB lesions. So eosinophils um, are really more associated with um, type 2 immune responses and allergy and, and helmet infections. And so um, I'm sharing this unpublished data with you because as um, an early career investigator, I do not have you know, mountains of papers to tell you. And I really want to show a little bit about the kind of research we're currently doing and where this is going. So what I'm showing you here is a uh, whole blood um, from this individual where we can, you can very clearly see the eosinophils here labeled with cyclic 8, um, but also CD66B um, um, for the neutrophils. And this is the normal proportion that you would expect in, in blood. But when you start looking at the, the tissue level from the same individual, what is striking is that there is a big uh, proportion of eosinophils. And uh, what I want to highlight here is, for example, in this granuloma, the majority of the granulocytes seem to be eosinophils. So that was really unexpected. And we're trying to, to answer really the questions, um, uh, what is the role um, of eosinophils in host resistance and why are they, why are they in the uh, lesions? Is the, has this to do with tissue remodeling responses? And, maybe is not uh, relevant for TB. And so we're trying to address that. One of the ways we did that is we just looked in, in, and confirmed this first um, uh, by, by histology. And what I'm showing you here um, is just regular H&E of a human uh, TB lung granuloma. And I think what you can appreciate if you look carefully here, there are indeed eosinophils um, in the outer rim of this granuloma. 
And when we stain with a marker specific for eosinophils called eosinophil peroxidase, you can also identify these here. And maybe most uh, intriguingly, you can see that the necrotic core is, is really filled with um, this degranulated uh, molecule from eosinophils. We then confirmed this in non-human primates. Um, and here, what we, what we uh, found similar to the human granulomas that we can indeed detect eosinophils with H and E and um, this very specific EPX um, staining. And lastly, in collaboration with Mark uh, Cronin, we were able to um, show that um, even in, in granulomas in the sepa fish with M. marinum infection, um, this classic granuloma, TB granu um, microbacterial granuloma structure, we are able to identify the, these eosinophils as well. So the presence of eosinophils really seems to be evolutionary conserved. So we then wanted to ask, well, do they respond to TB? And so we had to develop a way to identify eosinophils at the single cell level in non-human primates, because all of the human antigens did not cross-react. So we found that EPX is a very specific marker for eosinophils and that we can utilize this in the non-human primate model. So here I'm showing you a, an animal before infection and after, two weeks after infection. And I think what is very clear is that there is a significant increase in eosinophils in the airways after MTB infection. And we quantify this now in, in 10 different um, animals. One of the uh, uh, next steps we had to do is to convince ourselves that this is really interesting and how could we understand the biological relevance of this is we eventually have to go to the mouse model. Then of course we have a whole different arsenal of experimental approaches. And here I want to show you um, some lung imaging we've uh, uh, generated inside the high containment. Um, this is a time lapse of um, eosinophil reporter mice shown here in pink and TB here in cyan. And um, you can see the lung structure. So this is basically a thick section that has been rested and then we can just uh, take a movie. And I think, um, you know, uh, an image speaks more than, than anything else. Very clearly in mice, we can find eosinophils that interact and sense MTB infected cells and directly interact with TB even. So eosinophils um, respond to TB and we can find them interacting with MTB infected cells. So then the question was, well, how does um, uh, eosinophils um, uh, play a role and, and do they play a role more importantly? And to this, we, we used eosinophil deficient mouse lines. Here I'm showing you the Delta double Garda strain, both on the bulb C and the black six background. And I think what's very clear is that even with the low dose infection, um, these animals are actually highly susceptible to TB. And the susceptibility, susceptibility increases with infectious dose, arguing this is really driven by the bacterial infection and that eosinophils are important for host resistance against TB. So we were quite surprised by this and then we wanted to confirm this and we used a, a different strain of eosinophil deficient mice called the fill strain, where um, eosinophils are also selectively depleted in development and we actually were able to observe the exact same phenotype. So to our surprise, eosinophils are actually important. Um, it's a new player that we had not really experimentally addressed before in the field, and it's a really unexpected role and we're trying to make sense of this. Um, the data is very clear at this point, um, but, but why would eosinophils, an innate cell type typically associated with type 2 immunity, um, contribute to MTB? Uh, host resistance. So um, this is something that we're trying to, to understand. And um, this has uh, been a real team effort and I really want to highlight um, the, the brave TV soldiers that, you know, embarked on this path with me. Um, uh, first and foremost, Andrea Bora and Edel Castro, they're um, amazing um, scientists working uh, uh, in the high containment lab, like, like their champs. Um, they really uh, drove most of the work you've seen so far. They've both been with me for three years. Um, the eosinophil work and the transprotection work was also contributed a lot by um, Claire Tuchini um, and then the, the postdocs. Um, of course, uh, the amazing collaborators here at the uh, intramural program. I want to thank Alan Scher, of course. He's been a fantastic mentor and colleague over the years. 
Um, we do the non-human primate work in collaboration with Laura Vai and Dan Barber. We have lots of other um, uh, collaborators, uh, too many to mention individually. I want to thank the uh, high containment facility staff um, and our clinical collaborators. Um, they are very important and the past and present collaborators. And uh, if I haven't mentioned you, uh, I apologize. Um, but this is really a team, team effort. And if you're interested in learning more, please contact me. We're always looking to expand our team and we have more questions than, than hands to answer and brains. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. That was beautiful, important work, very clearly delivered. Uh, very interesting to see the function of these cells that we don't tend to think about so much, right? Like the eosinophil. So thank you so much. Thank you. And Elena is going to remind us how people can ask you questions. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Kat. That was fantastic. Uh, how intriguing the, the how eosinophils protect and how this may relate to, to your previous work. It's, it's terrific, the work you're doing. Thank you so much for sharing your previous work and your unpublished uh, data. We really appreciate it. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm sure people will have questions, but we'll have to do, as always, via Twitter. So uh, if you would like to ask questions to Kat, search for the account Global Immunotalks, find a tweet that says, ask questions for uh, Dr. Katrin Mayer Barber here, and then reply to that tweet. And remember to mention the hashtag Global Immuno. And then Kat will use her own Twitter account uh, for answering the questions. So thank you so much again, Kat, for the beautiful seminar. And thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, remember, next week uh, is uh, talking uh, what is racist will be uh, giving the talk. And so we hope you join us again. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Bye Kat.